If Embiid returns, how far can the Sixers team go? We'd have to see him. Um, this isn't really a surprise. He got uh, the type of surgery that he got, even though the Sixers have been very vague about this injury, and I don't think it's always been the best look for them or Embiid, but whatever. He had a portion. It, would, it appears like he had a portion of his meniscus removed. That would enable him to return. I think that was absolutely always on the table from the moment that they completed the surgery. Of course, he has to hit all kinds of steps between now and then and not have any setbacks. But the 76ers went out and added at the trade deadline with Buddy Heald specifically because they were planning on having Embiid back. When Embiid, if and when he comes back, if it's in late March or early April or whatever, and he comes back out there and he's looking like this, I think the Sixers have a chance to threaten everybody in the East. If he's operating a little slower and he can't get his minute load up and his efficiency goes down, then we're going to be focusing more on next season. But uh, actions over words, I'll say it until I'm blue in the face. The Sixers don't make that buddy heel deal, a guy who's a free agent, basically a rented player potentially, unless they believe that Embiid comes back and unless they believe they can make a deep playoff run. I completely agree. And, and, and here's the thing. I'm suspicious of, you know, whether he makes it back. How much time are you talking here? Is it really going to be something the Sixers are going to want to do to throw him out there for two, three, four, five games and then enter the fray of the playoffs into a best of seven with that level of intensity? I don't know if they're going to go that route or not. I think they're going to kind of play this by ear. But let's just assume he does come back with enough games that it makes sense for the Sixers. I completely agree because there are question marks up and down the east outside of Boston. You know, you know, Cleveland, as good as they have been defensively in the run that they've gone on here over the last six weeks or so, I think a lot of people still look at them and say, is this really a team that you can see maybe making a run all the way to the finals? I don't know that people know that. The Knicks have a lot of questions. they got a lot of injuries right now. You don't know what's going on with Julius Randle. They've just added new pieces, and they haven't really played together yet. So the Knicks have some question marks, and obviously the Bucks have a lot going on. So with all of that and that opening created – Embiid comes back, and here's the one thing the Sixers know. There's only one Joel Embiid. Like, he is the differentiating factor for them. They have him. So he comes in and immediately becomes maybe the toughest individual scoring matchup in the entire league. There's no real answer for Joel Embiid, the way he shoots the mid-range at his size. So right off the bat, you throw this force onto the court that nobody's got a great answer for, and you've added another piece in Buddy Heald that should fit great alongside of Embiid and Maxi, he's already played very well for them without Embiid. You add Embiid to the mix, the number of clean looks Buddy Heald gets, um, and Tobias Harris has had a very good year. Sixers absolutely could make a serious threatening run in the East if they get Joel Embiid back. Also, he's going to be fresh. Those legs aren't going to have the normal grind of 82 games by that point. This break can actually do you some good. Steph Curry went through this a few years ago. He had a second half of the season injury. And he looked amazing when they got to the playoffs because his legs felt so energized. That's where Embiid would be. And Molly, one thing I'm going to point out real quick. Yeah. I know that everybody thinks that they, it's title or bust for everybody. <laughs> but remember, the Sixers are now in position to have up to $60 million in salary cap space this summer. They are also auditioning for potential star players. If they look good in this, in this postseason and look like they've got a great future, it, even if they get knocked out before they want to, it could potentially lead to positive things down the road. Legs, what do you think? No, I don't think so. Look, I love AI, man. Nobody respects more what he did and what he accomplished at his size. Here's why. There's a couple reasons why he wouldn't get to that number. First of all, just we can't just start playing around with numbers like, you know, it's easy to get there. Uh, since Jordan's like two big years he had late 80s, it's been 35 years since then. Only two guys have even gotten to 35 in a year. Uh, Kobe did it once, Harden did it once. Maybe Embiid could have done it potentially this year if he didn't get hurt. Um, so it's just a very difficult number just to get to 35, much less get to 40. And now you're talking to 43. That's, so that's the first reason. Secondly, the usage rate would not be allowed. You just wouldn't be allowed to do that because of the way that they view these players and what they're doing with them on an average night. The usage rate you'd have to have to get to 40 plus points per game. It just there's no way an organization would allow that to happen. And then finally, you need to incorporate the three point shot to a greater degree. That wasn't really his strength. That's not what he wanted to do. He didn't take a lot of them and he shot around 31% when he did take them. That would have to be a big part of your game to average those kind of numbers as a guard. That's not what the league looks like anymore, Winnie. That's not even what's considered a quality shot, a mid range or a shot at the rim. Teams hunt three point shots. That's what they do. 
So that didn't really necessarily jive with the way AI played, and I just don't think any team would have a guy out there. He averaged 41 minutes a game 11 times in his career for a season. Like, there's just no way. You're playing 35 minutes a night. You're not getting to that number. So I hear what he's saying. It sounds logical. The, the reality is that's just not going to happen. Before I get flamed by Iverson fans, I just want to say, of course, if AI was playing in his prime today, his game would be different, and, the de and he would take advantage of the defensive rules, although nobody got fouled in that era more than AI because he knew how to get fouled, and he might get to the line less. But before I say that, he obviously would not 100% be apples to apples. That said, if AI played today, he would be heavily criticized. He would be way more heavily criticized about his style of play than he was then because he was a low efficiency player. Now, at the time, the entire league was sort of more lower efficiency and the 76ers were built to have sort of four strong defensive minded guys who couldn't play offense around him and then give him the ball and let him go to work. It wasn't because it was a character flaw or anything like that. But if you go look at the way he played, he played a lot of minutes and just chucked a lot of shots. And if 41% of them went in, it was considered a good job. That would not fly in today's game. Uh, you look at Embiid. Embiid was averaging 35 points before he got hurt on 22 shots in, f in 33 minutes. That's unbelievable. It's one of the greatest efficiency seasons of all time. The year that AI won the MVP, he averaged 26 shots for 31 points, um, thought shot just 41% from the field. I think actually 42% from the field. AI would not be afforded to have as much of a control of the offense in today's game if he didn't, if he wasn't a more efficient player. And I'm not saying he wouldn't be. Maybe he would be. But AI of AI thrived in that era. In this era, he wouldn't be able to do that. And as you said, legs, I don't think they'd give him the ball as much because if you only shot 42%. You wouldn't be allowed to take 26 shots a game.